my topic today my topic today is one that you may think oh well, wait a second we know all what it is all about it's about conversion you may think oh well we understand conversion well we keep the sabbath and holidays and we understand conversion no brethren it's much more than that but um before that the uh, exciting things are happening in asia and uh, i need to tell you i need to tell you some things one thing that i need to tell you is that we're hope of israel uh, the reason why we're hope of israel is that that doctrine is the core doctrine of the bible uh, but however i'm afraid we have over the years over the decades we have ignored certain things certain historical data and uh, i think it's the end time and it's time for that we stop ignoring that what have we been ignored well the famous josephus josephus whom you some of you at least in the west understand who he is over the decades the church always used josephus to tell us about the wars of the jewish people the fall of the fall of jerusalem to the hands of romans and all of that and josephus was always counted as reliable historical source indeed he is however in Josephus' work, there is something else, brethren, that we have ignored for decades, and we are not going to ignore it anymore. And there is one, one sentence, one account in his work, which says that beyond Euphrates, the river Euphrates used to be a borderline between Judea, which was occupied by the Rome and Roman Empire, and, and mark this, Parthian Empire. Parthian Empire. You have never heard of it. You will find it now in video games, but you have never heard of the Parthian Empire. Why have you not heard of the Parthian Empire? Well, listen to this. Josephus tells us that beyond Euphrates, there are many, 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 many members of the ten tribes of Israel. Surprise, surprise, my dear friends. Which means that those Ten tribers, actually, before this dispersed, were dispersed obviously all over the place, but before they went to Europe and dispersed elsewhere, many of the ten tribers actually were living in Asia. Living in Asia. It was a huge empire. There is a book, Parthian Empire, written by Stephen Collins. I want, I encourage all of you who can perhaps obtain that book, those of you in the West, and then you can later perhaps obtain a copy for, for others. Uh, the Parthian Empire book could be by Stephen Collins. Stephen Collins has written several books on the Israelite history. Those books are incredibly informative, incredibly relevant, and uh, they would just blow your mind away. And blow your mind once again to show you how many things we do not know, we have not understood, or we have ignored for whatever reason. Brethren, many members of the ten tribes were beyond Euphrates in Asia, in the vast, vast, vast area of Asia, extending from, from, from Armenia to Afghanistan. So the, the, the Parthian Empire was an empire, it was a kingdom which had a, 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 a certain uh, a governing body, wise men or magi as you call them in english does the word magi ring the bell with you of course he does because who came to worship jesus christ the jewish king well you all in the, in the west call them magi yes well the parthian empire was ruled by the magi but the magi because in case the king would get sick or that he would go mad or that something would happen to the king then this council of wise men was entitled to choose a new king but but listen to this one all the male members of the male descendants sorry of the royal family of parthia were entitled to be chosen as a king so the wise wise men council the council of magi would just you know have a session and then have a discussion and choose select the best suitable candidate and now comes the shocking part. Jesus Christ was a descendant of the Parthian royal family. 
which means because the Parthian Empire was composed of the ten tribes of Israel, that means that he was entitled to be the king to the ten tribes as well. Why does that shock us? He's coming back as the king of Israel, king of kings and lord of lords, brethren. And then you can understand how those Magi, when they came, they were just so audacious. They just like, you, you could just imagine them stomping into Herod's Herod. You know who was Herod? We'll just Google a little bit about the Herod, Herod the dic dic dictator. They just stomped into his office. Where is the king? Where is the Jewish king that we may worship him? You would just stop and think, how could anybody dare to stomp into, a, into the office of such a dictator? Well, brethren, because the Parthian Empire was a mighty empire, and the Parthian Empire at one point conquered Judea. They didn't stay there for long. You can find it in, the, in this book, Parthian Empire, written by Stephen Collins. Anyway, they didn't stay there for long, but they nevertheless uh, occupied. And 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 then and you may wonder why and how in the world that we do never, never hear about the Parthian Empire. Brethren, because we are learning falsified Roman history. Does that surprise you? Is that shocking to you? Why is it shocking to you, brethren? All of the ecclesiastical or church history has been falsified by Rome. And why shouldn't be the secular history not falsified by Rome. <laughs> it's falsification. The thing is that the Parthian Empire crushed the Roman so-called invincible army about three or four times, crushed them so badly, and, uh, right, and because they crushed them so badly, the Romans, it was a shame for the Roman invincible army, so the Rome made sure to hush, 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 hush about the Parthian Empire. Because Parthian Empire was also very democratic and very free-minded, just like the, something like the, 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 uh, the Western world today would be. And being so democratic and so having wide liberties... Armenia, the country of Armenia, was constantly wanting to be under the Parthian rule, not under the Roman rule. So Armenians constantly tried to fight off the Romans. You didn't know that, did you? Of course you didn't. Because there was nobody to tell you that, brethren. But today we're in the end times. We do have enough literature. We do have enough authors. We do have enough information. And we're not going to be slaves to ignorance anymore. So beyond the Euphrates... There was a large, 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 huge, humongous population of the ten tribers. We now know from the history that they formed the Parthian Empire. We know now from the history that Jesus Christ himself was a descendant of their royal family and was also entitled to be their king should there be need for a new king to be elected. The famous Magi, brethren, we have very, very short account in the New Testament about them. The famous Magi might have been only three, but they will be the three in the delegation of the Parthian, mighty Parthian Empire. And because Romans were defeated few times by the Parthian Empire, the order to Herod in Jerusalem was, by all means, do not get into conflict with the Parthian Empire. That was a very strict order which he had to obey. And he did. He did. So they stormed into his office, this, you might say, uh, diplomatic delegation, which enjoyed diplomatic immunity. They asked for the Jewish king. And then you remember how they gifted Jesus Christ among things with the gold. But now comes the historical account, brethren, historical account from Josephus that we have established as a, 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 as a reliable historical source. Josephus tells us that, yes, there were three magi, but it was only three that came to Jerusalem. Since they were a diplomatic mi on a diplomatic mission and since they were carrying gifts for the Jewish king, and they gave him even gold. All that gold and stuff was safeguarded by the guards. There were various servants, cooks, and all that, all that stuff that always goes with dip diplomats. It was a huge caravan 
that came to Jerusalem and the whole city was in turmoil because it was coming from the Parthian Empire. They were all the conquered ones and they thought, well, are they coming now to conquer us again? So the whole city was in a turmoil. It wasn't like a minor, minor little event that nobody paid attention to. No, brethren, on the contrary, the whole city of Jerusalem was in uproar. And they give to Jesus Christ with huge amount of gold, by the way. Then you may wonder later, as we read the, 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 the Gospels, you may wonder that Jesus Christ didn't, didn't really have any occupation, in a sense. The apostles were also free to preach, feeding all those multitudes and all of that. And you may wonder, well, well, well logical. Logical conclusion. All that huge gold that his parents stashed away. And, you know, put it in, in a bank of that time. And by the time he grew up, he could use all that gold. Brethren, it all just makes perfect sense. Not to mention to you that from Stephen Collins' books, you will learn something else. When Jesus Christ was crucified, it was Joseph of Arimathea. He is accounted in the gospel only as a believer. Well, true. But something else is there, brethren. Something else. Because how could somebody... Anonymous, non-important, ask for his body to be taken off the, of the cross. Brethren, Joseph of Arimathea was the uncle of Jesus' mother Mary. Oh, he was also a Roman citizen. Oh, even more. For the benefits of the Roman Empire, he traded with so-called tin islands as the British Isles used to be called, Tin Islands. So he was trading in metal for the for the benefits of the Roman Empire, having Roman citizenship. He was a well outstanding member of the local community. That's why he he managed to take his body so quickly before the high Sabbath or the first day of unleavened bread started and he was able to bury it. Are you shocked even more? Yeah, be be shocked even more. And even to this day, as far as I have been informed, and I need to go and see it with my own eyes, or, or, or somebody, when we have somebody in Britain, will have to go and, and, and verify some of those things with their own eyes. Even to this day, in the city, English city of Glastonbury, there is a house on which there is a plague, plague saying, this is a house of Jesus Christ and Joseph of Arimathea. Are you shocked? Why should you be shocked? Joseph of Arimathea was trading and doing business for the benefits of the Roman Empire. Jesus Christ lost his father. His father died. And we've got about 15 years there between his young age and the 30 when he goes into the synagogue in Nazareth and say, when he said, in this day, this has been fulfilled in your years. In those 15 years, what do you think that Jesus Christ was doing? Well, he was taking care, obviously, being the eldest son, taking care of the family. That was a Jewish tradition. All Jewish tradition was also having a, a, a older sibling taking care. Taking older sibling would be like a mentor to the uh, uh, when 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 some of his when some of the, when some of their relatives would lose the the house the house the head of the household. But what do you think that Jesus Christ was doing in those 15 years? Huh. Obviously, he would go with the Joseph of Arimathea. He would just accompany him to his uh, business trips, you might say. Have you ever heard, listen to this one now, have you ever heard the unofficial English anthem, not British, unofficial anthem of England? If you haven't, please, after the services, go look for it because we live in the Internet age and we, we have no reason to be ignorant just go Google out on YouTube English unofficial anthem and just listen to the lyrics. And you tell me, brethren, you tell me who is that anthem talking about? Who is that lamb, lamb roaming, treading the beautiful, pleasant land of England? You tell me that. You give me a rational explanation of the English unofficial anthem, if you could. If you didn't know this, all this information I've told you. And there is more. Oh yes, there is more. Just to show to you how much we have been ignoring things relevant 
to us, to us as Israelites, as spirit-led Israel, to us and to Israel in general as God's people. So Josephus, please expand your understanding now. Beyond Euphrates, there were many ten tribers. They formed a huge Parthian empire. It was a world empire, extensive in Asia. And then when Randy came the other day and said, oh, we've got uh, anointed cloth request from India. Well, I'm not surprised. We've got a request, a request from Pakistan. Oh, I'm not surprised. And then he comes excitingly, look, somebody from Afghanistan. Oh, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, well, I said, I said, yeah, it makes sense. I said to, then I said to Randy, I said, did you know the name of the anthem is Jerusalem? There, there you go. Yes, an official English anthem. To those of you who are still want, who those of you who may not be convinced about the Bible history, I challenge you. Here is another challenge. Look for the flag of Northern Ireland or Ulster flag. Just look it up and try to explain to me how could that flag exist if you did not know anything from the Bible history. Just to titillate your interest, the Ulster flag has got Jewish, so-called Jewish Star of David with the red hand in the middle of it. That's the official flag of Ulster, Northern Ireland. Now, if we didn't know anything about Jeremiah, if we didn't know anything about the British crown, if we didn't know anything about Pharisees and Zara, the sons, the twin twin sons of Judah, we would be, we would be perplexed. But of all people on the face of the earth, brother, we have no reason to be perplexed. Go so back to Afghanistan. <laughs> Then I said to Randy, I said, Randy, did you know, did you know that there was a Parthian Empire once upon a time? And did you know that the leading tribe of Afghanistan, Pashtuns, there are indications that they've got various Israelitish customs and, the, and some of them, many of them claim to be descendants of the lost house of Israel. Of course, Randy had no clue about that. And I happen to have clue about that because, you know, I've researched it a little bit, and I remembered that piece of information. I, I, you know, I didn't promote it, but I remembered it. And guess what? So I asked this guy in in Afghanistan. I said, uh, uh, "Could you, uh, you know, could you provide for?" Uh, I said, "Did you know about the Pashtuns and that they claim?" <laughs> Sure enough, he knew. Not only that he knew, but he just provided us a quote from the Bible about when, uh, uh, when the Assyrians exiled Israelites. He quoted that verse and he quoted the, the, the geographic locations when they were exiled and showed to us, sent us a map, he sent me a map, showing to me where those locations are today. Yeah, be surprised. Where are they located? Well, surprise, surprise. Pakistan and Afghanistan. Shocking. Why is it shocking to anybody, brethren? So they're lost Israelites, as I told you a million times. They're lost Israelites everywhere. Because Amos 9.9 9 says, I'll scatter the house of Israel. I'll sift the house of Israel into all the nations. All the nations means all the races. They're everywhere, brethren. They're everywhere. When you look at the book of Hosea, the very first picture, you have a farmer scattering seeds, just scattering it on the field everywhere, all over the place. Which My point is, we need to clear this fog. Yes, we traditionally have always understood that the, how the Israelitish nations today are in Northwest Europe, British Isles, Australia, New Zealand. That's true. You see, but please get this, brethren, get this once and for all. Why are we hope of Israel? Because it's hope of all nations anyway. Now, uh, get this. The, dis the, the, the descendants of all, of all 12 brothers of Israel, they had to be in a large number gathered in certain geographic areas in order to fulfill the prophecies of the end time. Because when you go to Genesis 49, at his deathbed, Jacob tells his sons what their descendants in the end time will be fulfilling, brethren. And in order for their descendants to fulfill that, they had to be 
concentrated in large numbers in certain geographic areas like Australia, like Canada, like America, like Northwest Europe. However, however, many others who belong to the tribes of Israel did not congregate with them, but have been sifted, scattered into all the nations. Why should that shock anybody? It's time that we start believing when the Bible says your descendants will be like the stars of heaven, like the like the the, 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 the sand of the sea. So the huge Israelitish kingdom before all of the Northwest Europe and British Isles and stuff was located in Asia, you see. It was located in Asia before they moved later to Europe and so on. But, I'm, but my question to you is, are we to expect the remnants of the lost house of Israel in Asia? Are we to expect it? And I hope that your common sense tells you, yes. In fact, what we are experiencing these days shows to our common sense that the answer is yes. Because why would somebody in Afghanistan, you know, start keeping the Torah? Why? What about India? Ever thought about Brahmans, famous Brahmans in India? When you say Brahman, does that, does that resemble to you the name of one of the biblical patriarch? Who is the father of the faithful? Oh, you would all say to me, Abraham. Oh, sure. We have Brahmans in India. I can give you some more. Japan. Shocking revelation. Too many these days. Japan. What about Japan? Well, the scholars of Japan have informed some of my friends who are doing the research into the researching the lost tribes. They have informed them, scholars in Japan, have informed them that the Hebrews, as they called the House of Israel, the Hebrews were part of founding their nation. In fact, those scholars, as far as I've been informed, still have regular meetings in Tokyo. And some of those meet the meetings are being held online. So uh, I was even proposed, it was proposed to me that I be included in those in those meetings eventually i said okay fine but i'm not shocked brethren brethren for years i understood that there are who knows how many lost israelites in japan how did i know it well i think i've told you that already to all of you personally but i've never made it official so let it, let the whole world hear it now the regalia the symbol of the japanese royal family and you would say, well, what about that? Well, what about that? The symbol is the flower called lotus. And do you know whose symbol lotus was? <laughs> it was a symbol of Solomon's temple. Oh, surprise, surprise. And the Japanese Tsarist or royal family family's uh, symbol is lotus, a spittled image of Solomon's Lotus. So for years I have known that there are who knows how many Israelites in Japan, lost Israelites in Japan. We don't know how many, but now the scholars confirm that the Hebrews participated, took part in the foundation of their Japanese nation. In fact, brethren, to let me shock you even more, from what I've heard this year, these, those scholars obviously feel so much attached now to that truth, they kept the Feast of Tabernacles <laughs> this year. But why should that be shocking to us? When we have all the facts, and we know all the facts, there is nothing shocking to us. In fact, according to the estimation, this is only estimation, but one person who spoke to my friend from Sydney, by the way, we have a, we, I have a friend in Sydney, uh, Margot Crossing, she travels to Asia very often, and she gathers all those various facts. 
And last year when I kept after the Feast of Tabernacles, I visited her and she told me, I remember she told me, she said, Sasha, there is one tribe in Asia, in Asia that is certainly Israelitish tribe. Which tribe is that? Is the Karen tribe, K-A-R-E-N, from Myanmar or Burma. They've been dispersed a little bit around because of the uh, civil war and then and, and the war between the Burmese, Burma, Burmese, Burmese government and whatever, they're rebels. But anyway, she says, they're certainly Israelites because you can see by the customs they have and stuff. All oh, right. I already, before she even told me, I, I already had some kind of indications that they were from, from other sources. Brethren, right now, Today, as we sit here, there is at least, listen to this now, at least one million, and this is very conservative estimation, at least one, it might be 100 million, secret Sabbath keepers. In which country, you may wonder? Well, in the country that we would least, least expect, the communist China. Right now, there is at least one million, and it's very conservative estimation because I'm, I'm very conservative so that I would not blow things out of proportion. But it might well be that it's 100 million. What is 100 million with a nation in a nation that has 1 billion citizens? Or, okay, let's make it several thousands. All right, Let, let's be even more conservative. Secret Sabbath keepers in China. Now, if you don't know anything about China, which you probably do not, in the 19th century, there was a huge Sabbath-keeping movement in China. That's another history. And one Swiss missionary wrote even a couple of books about them. Believe it or not, those books were online, at least when I went to download them. A couple of books talking about the history and, and, and things, how those things happened to those Chinese Sabbath, you wouldn't believe what God is capable of doing. You should believe what God is capable of doing when he wants to call somebody to the truth. But right now, as we sit here, right now, brethren, there's thousands and thousands of secret Sabbath keepers in China. We don't know. As far as I, as far as I was able to discern, they're not Adventists. They're not Church of God Seventh Day. They're just Sabbath keepers. Well, if they keep the Sabbath, that means that they must understand something from the Bible. They must be reading at least the Torah. They must be understanding. You see what I mean? And we're talking about Asia all this time, if you, if you paid attention. China, Japan, India, Burma. In fact, one of the greatest uh, uh, pro projects we had was in Asia. Two projects within in Asia, if you consider Jordan as well. But the, the great product, one of the greatest projects for which the royal family of, of, of Thailand has been e eternally thank, thankful to Herbert Armstrong was in Thailand. And in fact, as far as I remember, some of the former ambassador students remained in Thailand and organized something like Ambassador College for all these various youth of these various tribes in Asia. Do you know which tribe is the most represented there? <laughs> the current tribe that I just mentioned to you. And those people there, those 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 uh, 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 people who teachers at that ambassador there, the, the, it, it, I, I think it's a couple. But those two, when they want to go to the palace of Thailand's king and queen, the guards move themselves automatically nobody stops them just to just to illustrate to you the level of the level of respect that herbert armstrong even still enjoys in that country and the level of respect that all those associated with herbert armstrong do enjoy in that country of course you didn't know all of this but now you do brethren the level of, of respect that, 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 that those people from ambassadors, former ambassador college students enjoy there is equal to what to the respect we enjoy today with the Malavian government. So again, Parthian Empire used to be in Asia. Parthian Empire used to be a huge empire. 
Parthian Empire was made up of the ten tribers. And the Magi, who came to see the king of the Jews, were actually diplomatic representatives of the Parthian Empire because Jesus Christ was also, by his descent, he was also a connected, related to the Parthian royal family. Shocking things. And today, the conservative estimation, I mentioned about China, but conservative estimation about all of Asia, as far as what my friend Margaret was he heard from that man, the conservative estimation is that there are 2 billion descendants of the House of Israel in Asia. Why, why should we not believe that, brethren? Like the stars in heaven, you just go out at night and try to count all those stars. Try to go to the seashore. At least you in Australia have got plenty of wonderful beaches and everybody else and those of you, well, we don't have anybody from Miami, but famous Miami Beach. Try to count all those, all those <laughs> pieces of sand if you could. That's what the Bible says, brethren. It's time that we start believing the Bible. And it's time that we start believing Josephus, not only on the Jewish history and the fall of Jerusalem, but that we believe him on what he told us about the ten tribes beyond Euphrates. And again, there, there's a book, Parthian Empire. It's only one book of Stephen Collins. He's written several books. But Parthian Empire, there is something I want the whole, whole church, hope of Israel to understand. And by that, I want you to once again understand how much we have been lied by our school systems and how much we have heard rubbish. Brethren, the school system is the Roman falsification and the school system is trying to hide from us relevant information. Last night I talked to Randy for a couple of hours. There is more. Oh yes, there is more Columbus, Columbus discovering America. Oh please. Oh, please, just give me a break. Vikings were before Columbus, and they were all the present. Their Viking, Viking scripts and Viking settlements were present in Canada before Columbus. And there is another, there was another Israelitish colony that knew, and the colony was settled on the Gibraltar Strait. It's called Carthaginian colony. Carthaginians, of course, they were sea people, seafaring people. They they discovered across the Atlantic a very rich, lovely country, which they would just send their expeditions to get, you know, rich things, timber, gold, and everything else. Carthaginians knew about America long before, and when they were just uh, when they were conquered by the Romans, when the Romans. They fought with Romans, when Romans wanted to give, to, to put an end to all of that. The Romans occupied Car Carthaginian uh, uh, colony. But instead of finding thousands and both thousands of Carthaginians, they found a handful of thousands. The rest disappeared. Oh, really? Where did they go? Did they go perhaps to the moon? No, brethren. They just loaded on the barrages and ships all of their households, all their livestock, all their families. And what? Guess what? Sailed away. Where did they sail away? Across the Atlantic. <laughs> because they knew, unlike the Romans and the Greeks, they knew, they knew, the Carthaginians knew that across the Atlantic was a rich and beautiful land. The land of the free today. Oh, my dear America, how much, how much you have been delusioned by your education system. Columbus. Let me give you something else that I've learned from my friend Gene Porter. Sorry if, if this, this, this seems, hopefully this doesn't seem boring to Yes, the topic today is about conversion, and I'm going to go into that in a minute. But, uh, but I just want to give you all this information just to illustrate to you how many things, brethren, we did not know, how many things we might have ignored. Columbus, according to what my friend Gene says, and it makes sense, Columbus used actually the Spanish royal family to supposedly go and to discover the new world. But actually, Columbus was a Jew. Oh, another shocking information. Not only was he a Jew, but Columbus wanted to find a way, a new world in which the Jewish, Jewish population persecuted by the Inquisition would find its refuge. <laughs> there is one place well known on Mexican-American border called El Paso, meaning passage in Spanish. 
But brethren, that's not its full name. The full name of that place is El Paso de los Judíos, or the Passage of the Jews. Oh. So that was the way where various Jewish refugees from Inquisition just, you know, fled. Oh, by the way, speaking of Asia, speaking of Asia and the Jews, the only country in Asia, basically, that opened up its borders for the Jewish refugees from the Holocaust is now another country which... Uh, you know, Randy always gets 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 so excited, and he he says to me, "I've sent three booklets on the uh, three booklets on three Sabbath booklets to Philippines." Oh, I said, "Oh, there you go." The Philippines, brethren, that's the only southeastern Asia, Southeast Asia. That's the only nominal Christian country. All the rest are Buddhists and Hindus, and you know all of those things, but not the Filipinos. And you might remember there's that verse, how the glad tidings will go, come to, this, to, the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the islands and stuff. Well, it's not, Australia is not the only island in the world. Filipino nation is composed of, of myriads of islands. But even to these days, there are descendants of the Jews who were rescued by the Filipino people in the Second World War. The way to the Philippines was... was uh, was through another through another Chinese city, Shanghai, famous Shanghai, and uh, the, the the Jews again even to these days are there in the Philippines. The Philippines. What does that tell you? Even to this day, the relations between the Philippines and the state of Israel are very cordial. What does that tell you, brethren? In the old Worldwide Church of God, when Mr. Ramsko was alive, we used to have 3,000 members in the Philippines. And we said, oh, it's the Gentile nation with the largest number of members. True, Gentile nation indeed. But we don't know how many lost Israelites are in that nation. By the way, there have been several groups that went to the Philippines of the Worldwide Church of God origins, several groups, three or four, and they did some kind of evangelistic tours and campaigns. It was tremendously, tremendously visited by the Filipino nations and the various ministers, Sunday ministers and stuff, were just asking incredible questions. Brethren, does that tell you something? In fact, I have to check it now what happened to that. But back in then, back when I was reading about that, there were a couple of ladies in the Philippines who were part of the Filipino Congress, the legislative body. And they were trying and lobbying for the God's holidays to be involved, including into the Filipino law as the legal holidays and to be protected by the Filipino law. A couple of ladies, I can't remember their names now. I can't remember how were they part of the Congress. It doesn't really matter. But just to tell you, even that, how happy we would be if the Australian Parliament and New Zealand Parliament would protect by the Lord of God's holidays, well, it didn't happen to all nations. It didn't happen like that in America. It happened in the Philippines. I'm not sure what's the outcome of that. We can always check it, check, check upon that. But anyway, what does that tell you, brethren? But you know, the Jews are still not living even in Asia. Let's come to Africa, closer to us. Closer to us because we have got so much interest in Africa. Brethren, how could Igbo tribe in, in Nigeria claim to have to be descendants of the Jews? Lembo, Lemba tribe in Zambia, there is a Lemba tribe, they also claim to be from the Jews. Well, why should you be surprised? Did you know, Africans and the others, that up to the 8th century AD, Anno Domini, our age, 8th century, the official day of rest in the country named and called Ethiopia. The official day of rest in Ethiopia was the Sabbath. Oh, I bet you had no clue about it. Did you know, Africans and the others, that at one point one of the Ethiopian kings kicked out of his country the Jesuits and the Catholics? Did you know that? No, you didn't, probably. Even to this day, you've got the black Jews from Ethiopia in the state of Israel claiming to be Jews. 
And Ethiopia, obviously, was one point when the these when many Jews dispersed and probably other Israelites. And then, of course, they moved down south, down south into Africa, deeper into Africa. Sure enough. And then, when I was in Kenya, I'm sitting in a Kisi county, and the uh, local leader greets everyone with shalom, shalom, and the whole congregation responds, shalom, shalom. Then I asked them, what does that shalom mean? And uh, why do you have such a greeting? Nobody has a clue. They just inherited that from their ancestors, but nobody has a clue. Those of you who are well educated, you know who, what shalom means. To this day, the Jewish people greet one another with Shabbat Shalom. Peaceful Shabbat. Shalom means peace. And I've seen traces of Israelites all over Kenya. Please, I've seen it. Why would you name a hostel Jerusalem or Samaria or Judea? Or or why would you have a church such and such church, Jerusalem? And, you know, brethren, it doesn't make any sense unless you understand Amos 9.9 9, that God scattered Israel everywhere. Oh, yes, listen. Listen to all of you in Africa and elsewhere. So we've got the Jewish remnants, who knows where. We've got the rest of Israelites, who knows where. South Africa. South Africa was colonized first by the Israelites, first by the Dutch, then by the English. Then it was closely attached to Belgium. Think about it. So there are many lost Israelites among the blacks. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, certainly. And look at this all of a sudden. For the first time, as far as I know, in Church of God history, we have people from Uganda, very kind of exciting people from Uganda, well-organized people, very industrious, as far as I can see, people from Uganda. There. Contacting us, wanting to you know, join work with us. So our John is going to have plenty of work. I'm not a prophet, but I did predict him. I said, I wouldn't be surprised if very soon God will put you in a position to serve all of Africa. <laughs> and it's coming. It's coming, brethren. His workload is already great and will be bigger probably. But again, put all of that into this broader picture, the house of Israel into all nations, into all races. Why should you be surprised, brethren? Do we not believe the Bible? When it says, like stars in heaven, and it was a prophecy, what was it to Joseph? Out of your loins many kings shall come. Well, of course. <laughs> Certainly. Many kings, including Japanese Tsar. Could you believe that? Yes, indeed. I can. I can, I will, and i that's why I told you we are hope of Israel. Because of the importance of Israel in God's plan of salvation of humankind. But I want you to also get that broad picture, brethren. To get that vision. Without vision, people perish, says Prophet Isaiah. And Prophet Hosea adds to that, my people are perishing for what? For the lack of knowledge. I don't want us in this day and age of so much knowledge, so much availability of knowledge that we can even check even online. I mean, internet is like a big encyclopedia. I don't want us to be ignorant about these things. And there are other things I can tell you, but we're speaking about Asia and, 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 I, and I'm, I, I've added Africa. Right now in those two regions you have an explosion of interest. But the Celts, you all know that the Celts are descendants of Israel. Did you know that the Celts were the native inhabitants of the Balkan Peninsula? Balkan Peninsula is what is former Yugoslavia plus Albania, Greece, Romania, Bulgaria. That's the Balkan Peninsula. And I've got a book, which I I, 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 I I don't know when did I get it. I think I told you about the book. Balkan Celts. Celtic kings among the Yugoslav nations. 
archaeological archaeological remains of the Celts on the Balkans. Unbelievable, incredible. The River Danube, brethren. Mr. Armstrong, as Jamie told me, Mr. Armstrong only said when it comes to Israel, he just had discovered the trunk of the tree. Well, exactly. If he discovered the trunk of the tree, then we, his successors, are there to fill up those gaps and 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 and, and, and discover the rest of the tree. Danube never occurred to anybody. The Danube is the greatest monument of the House of Israel in Europe, brethren. Nobody did. I was the one. And I made it public in 2017 during a conference in Jerusalem. And my friend Gene Porter was there, so he is a witness to that. Because I've noticed in one of the books that I have in Serbian that Danube used to be called Ishtar or Easter. It doesn't say anywhere who changed the name, when the name was changed. But I don't need to know. I don't need to know when, but I know who. It's the tribe of Dan, of course renowned and prophesied in Genesis 49 that it will be naming locations and stuff after their forefather Dan. And also there's prophecy, I think, in Jeremiah somewhere to uh, 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 that, Dan, that, that it was the tribe of Dan, it was told of the tribe of Dan to place the way, uh, the way marks where, wherefore the wherefore the uh, Wherefore the tribes of Israel would go and pass and to put it as a waymark as 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 a sign. And look at the look at the river Danube, brethren. Serpent stray like a serpent going from the sea from the shores of the of the Black Sea where the Israelites were also exiled by the Assyrians, going all the way up to Northwest Europe. Where we know for sure and have been preaching for decades that Israelites went. Yes, indeed. But did you know something else? Speaking of Denmark, the resting place of Dan. Did you know that the uh, northern point of, the, of Denmark. Not only to mention the Denmark flag, by the way. Three, there are three lions. Three blue lions. That look just like the official flag of the city of Jerusalem today. It's a blue lion, believe it or not. <laughs> but Denmark, the northern part, there is a peninsula in Denmark, in the very north of Denmark, facing the sea and facing the British Isles. It's called Judenland. Jutland or Judenland, the land of the Jews. So obviously parts of the tribe of Judah went along with Israelites, were there, and then of course they crossed the sea and populated what? Populated the British Isles among with, along with these Ephraimites and, and others. Speaking of all that, those of you who want to check more, you've got it on the internet, Scottish Declaration, Declaration of Independence, <laughs> in which the Scottish people tell the Romans and Rome and Vatican, in a sense, who they are. You would be shocked, brethren. Yes, and you should be shocked. And so, so here is Denmark to this day. Here is Danube to this day. And yet, for decades, we never really pointed out Danube as having to do anything to do with the House of Israel. It does have to do everything with the House of Israel. It does have to do because the Israelites renamed it. The Israelites sailed, sailed through that blue, beautiful Danube, and it is called in one, one, one composition from Austria. And the Israelites, on their way to Northwest Europe, obviously many of them stayed behind. Where would they stay? Well, the ten countries the Danube goes through, flows through. The most beautiful banks of Danube are located in this country, in Serbia, indeed. Beautiful banks, wonderful banks, so attractive for life. Well, what do you think? Many Israelis did not leave behind. Of course they did. So, you know, I, I, I've come now to Europe. So, you see, from Asia and Africa, I come to Europe, and then we can, we should not start even about Australia, New Zealand, and so on, because, because more or less we know about New Zealand and Australia. But, brethren, we have all these little gaps gaps of, 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 of ignorance about the house of Israel and I want it to be rooted out from our midst. I want those people in Asia to understand that the history of the house of Israel is their history. 
Who knows in their ancestry who was Israelite? Just like those of you in Australia and England and, 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 and America, we know that you, you've got certainly ancestry from, from the Lost Tribes. But you know, there are many people in Asia and Africa who are not aware of that. Many people in Japan who have no clue about that. Brethren, to them, many people in Serbia and former Yugoslavia who have no clue about that to them, it'll be a huge revelation. Speaking of former Yugoslavia, one of the former Yugoslav states is called Macedonia. Don, din, dan, don, dun. Remember? It's explained right there in the Mr. Armstrong's most famous book, Britain and America. Macedonia. And even, were, even, even, even more interesting, one of the greatest mountain ridges in that country, well known to all of us here, it's actually called Skardi. Skordisks, because Skordisk is another name for Celts in this part of the world. Skordisk or Celts. And you've got Skordisk and Celts all over former Yugoslavia. Archaeological excavations, uh, uh, traces of culture, traces of, uh, of, of, of the dishes they used, uh, traces of their settlements everywhere, brethren. But people have no clue about that. And we are to be education forced to those people. Just like people in Africa, many of them have no clue who they are. Many people in the Anglo-Saxon world have lost clue who they are. But we do have all the proofs of that. With the Anglo-Saxon world, I just told you unofficial English anthem called Jerusalem. Who does have England has to do with Jerusalem, my word? Other than it just ruled Jerusalem and all that. But I know, but why would the unofficial unofficial anthem speak about the lamb treading the, 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 the pastures of this land and all of that? You tell me. You give me a logical explanation unless, unless we know that Jesus Christ obviously spent part of his life on the British Isles. Which spiritually now leads us to something that will be my last point and I'll start the, the message but I have to inform you this brethren because we have to stop being ignorant because we're house of Israel sorry with the hope of it yeah we're house of Israel but with the hope of Israel you see why because we have knowledge that we have to uh, inform the world and part of our mission is also Matthew 15 when Jesus Christ tells the apostles, do not go to the, to the way of heathens, to the way of Gentiles, do not enter into the cities of Samaritans, but only, only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And in Matthew 15, sorry, he says for, about himself. He says, for I was only sent, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Better we have to accept it. No, nothing is racist there. It's all part of God's plan of salvation of all humankind. So there is nothing racist there. It's all logical. It all makes sense. The Israelite seed has been scattered into all the nations and all the races, of course. So Jesus Christ, the King of Israel, can claim all the nations and all the races that he's going to rule in the kingdom of God. And he qualified while he was in flesh. The first time he qualified against the Satan. He was tempted by the Satan. So he qualified to rule the world. So there's nothing racist. There's nothing bad. There's nothing sinister about this. It's just a part of the beautiful plan of God. We, and we better understand. But that plan is, you see, it's far more beautiful and marvelous than we ever knew before. Because our limited understanding of the House of Israel was Northwest Europe, the British Isles, uh, British Commonwealth, the United States of America. Sure enough, it's true. But it's more than that. It's much more than that. It's Danube. It's the Balkan Celts. It is Macedonia. It is Africa. It is Ethiopia. It is Asia. It's Afghanistan. It's India, it's China, it's Japan, brethren, the whole world is there because the house of Israel got scattered everywhere. And that explains to you perhaps why, you know, we, we all said this term spiritual Israel, I don't see it in the Bible. You find me the term spiritual Israel in the Bible, and I'll say, okay, I capitulate. No, I don't find spiritual Israel. I find spirit-led Israel, so Israelites of different races and backgrounds who have lost who have lost their 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 uh, identity, and I've got people who know who, whoever 
where they are from but they just turn to the god of israel they keep the god the, the law of the god of israel and therefore they become israelites and of course then they got converted converted to the god of israel and they become they become spirit led israelites they've got the spirit of god of the god of israel that leads them into all understanding so therefore they become spirit led but spiritual israel i don't recall finding anywhere the term spiritual israel to me that's a strange term but, you know, the churches of God are used to calling this spiritual Israel. Well, fine. Let them enjoy their spiritual Israel. In the meantime, brethren, we keep finding out various places where Israel got scattered. And uh, as Randy was always excitedly would tell me, oh, from this country, from that country, I would always I would always be reminded of what do I know about that country in Asia or certain countries in Africa or certain tribes even in Africa and Asia and so on. And I was thinking, hey, this, this all makes sense. God is calling the remnant. Remember Isaiah Chapter 1, verse 9, if God didn't leave us remnant, we were, he's calling out the remnant of Israel. But not only the spirit-led Israel, the remnant even of physical Israel. In all the nations and races, so he's calling out the remnant, you know, to prepare that remnant for the kingdom of God, which will be, oh, somebody said to me on the internet, you make this up. Uh, it's nowhere says the kingdom of Israel will really. If you go to Acts chapter 1, when the apostles ask Jesus Christ, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They ask, brethren. I don't know what Bible some people read, but I'm, I, I think I'm reading the same Bible in Serbian and in English and in all of your languages. It says, it's. I think it's chapter, uh, it's Acts chapter 1 i think it's it's verse whether it's verse 6 or but in chaps in, in, in acts chapter 1 before when jesus christ is to, about to ascend to the heaven they ask him lord will you at this time restore the kingdom of israel it says israel right here even in serbia so better we, we better stop playing dummies and, and feeling ashamed almost oh israel because their people church leaders church of god leaders who have labeled that doctrine racist really really are we racist if we were racist we would not pay attention to any requests we have from asia and africa or anywhere else if we were so racist we would be just Limited to the Anglo-Saxon world, British Isles, Scandinavia, that'll be it. No, we're not racist. We just do understand the importance of the house of Israel. We just understand that through Israel, God was going to make a nation in the Old Testament as a, as a, as a model nation to all the world. It failed. Nevertheless, as a result of that failure, he just scattered them. Well, it's wonderful that he scattered them because in such a small area, geographic area where the state of Israel is today, uh, he could not he could not have fulfilled the prophecy given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that your descendants will be like stars, innumerable, so they will be like stars in heaven. That that huge amount of people cannot fit into that small area. But Asia is the largest continent in the world. But Africa has got a huge, vast places. Australia is a huge continent. America is a huge country. So, only when scattered, the house of Israel could have fulfilled what was prophesied for it. Brethren, it's time for us to finally understand it, to finally embrace this truth and jump up and down for joy. And you may wonder, all of a sudden, we wonder, how come that this explosion in Asia, this explosion? Well, brother, you know, you know why? Uh, let, let me be a bit, somebody will say you're so preposterous. Well, I might be. But brethren, there have not been the hope of Israel all until this year, never. There have never been a church which clearly stated without any shame about the second exodus. We're the only church of God whose statement of beliefs has point. 22 second exodus brethren it's one of the most outstanding teachings of the bible which the churches of god ignore their problem and some church of god leaders if they could be even counted to be church of god leaders anymore said at least in one association that i was part of in the past that it was a racist it was a racist uh, racist doctrine really oh really I don't see anything racist in it. I see I see the beautiful plan of God in that doctrine. 
Until my last breath, brethren, I'll be speaking about the house of Israel. You should see I'm preparing, I'm hoping I'm preparing myself for our hopefully new base, as they call it in Europe, hopefully one day. I've got some ancient maps about migration of people and this, that and the other. I'm just I'm just framing them. I'm just I'm just going to turn my living room into into a classroom. Into a classroom with all those maps, with all those things with 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 all the books i have on israel rather than israel the whole bible screams about israel the whole bible whether people like it or not from the first to the last book is actually the history of the house of israel and the apostle paul in romans 11 i keep pounding that until we all as christians understand it the apostle paul says the great mystery to all of us explains the great mystery is that all the nations will be grafted into israel and thus all the Israel will be saved. Exactly. What is so racist about that? So God must be racist, right? Because he's God of Israel. That's how he reveals himself in the Bible. And to all of you in Asia, in Africa, and elsewhere, who thought, well, you might thought, oh, we are, we are Gentiles. So no, 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 no. You are Gentiles spiritually, and we are all spiritually Gentiles, including those who have got physical descendants of Israel are spiritual Gentiles. All the Americans and Australians and New Zealanders and English, they're all Gentiles because they live like Gentiles, like pagans. But... But the history of the House of Israel, ancient House of Israel, is equally your history because it's very likely, <laughs> it's very likely that in your ancestry somebody was Israelite. And being so means that we are just, you know, that history pertains to you and me as much as it pertains to anybody else. So there's no reason that we have this, oh, it's a racist doctrine that we have fear. Oh, 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 all these scholars are going to condemn us because, sure, let them condemn us. They're ignorant, brethren. They're ignorant. And they are victims of falsified Roman history. <laughs> well, Rome falsified so many things. The Apostle Peter, so-called the Apostle Peter, as you know, is not even there in Rome. It's Simon Magus and so on and so forth. Therefore, people were grafted into Israel. To this, in these days, people just get converted. They get converted to become Israelites, and they just converted from Gentile lifestyle. Jesus Christ, in Matthew 18, 3, unless you are converted, you will by no means, listen to the words, brethren, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. That's Matthew 18, 3. And this plain and simple statement should, should, should just draw our attention right away because it literally demands that we find out what Jesus Christ meant, what it means to be converted. For unless we know what true conversion is, and further, unless we become converted, as he says, we will have no place in the kingdom of God, and therefore our hope is lost. That's what Jesus Christ said. Now, conversion means the changing of our minds and actions from the carnal way of the natural man to the spiritual way of, th of thinking and acting like God himself. We we're all born as natural people, regardless of our, of our origin, we we're born as natural people. But brethren, God is interested in our minds and in our hearts. So this change includes changing or converting from the physical chemical state of mere existence in which now we find ourselves to change to the immortal glorified life that God himself enjoys and of course it begins at baptism with the receipt of the Holy Spirit and then it continues through life because remember he's not once saved always saved forget about that you might lose the Holy Spirit you might just extinguish it in your life it continues after baptism throughout life with the spiritual growth of the individual and culminates at the resurrection, the first resurrection in our case, uh, when one is born into God's kingdom as a new creature, a spirit-composed member of God's family. Brethren, we, it's time that we start preaching this clearly again. This was a clear message in the last century and then all of a sudden it has got, got uh, uh, drowned by all kind of nice and fancy sermons we heard about <coughs> this, that, and the other, 
and we heard sermons about Christian living sometimes, that's okay. But brethren, the truth is we were born to become spirit-composed members of God's family. Shall we start preaching that clear and loud? We should, because I'm not sure that that vision is being shared by so many people, brethren. Because this, this world, this carnality, this falsified history, all that has dumbed our minds, has dulled our minds, has, has confused our minds, then it's time that we clear this fog out of our lives. Now, of course, this beautiful, brilliant history and plan of God, as revealed in the Bible, is not understood by the world, because the religious teachers of this world have, have not have not understood at all this vital process, even though they have got this born again, all of this rubbish that they, they preach. Well, rubbish, because it's rubbish. It has nothing to do with the Bible, brethren. They're going to, in a few days, they'll be keeping Christmas. Ignorant as they are. Now, there's one aspect of Christmas that we never really perhaps pointed out. At all those pagan holidays, Christmas, Easter, whatever, it was usual that the firstborn children were being sacrificed to the sun god Baal, brethren. Please get it. That's what's so horrible about it, because God remembers, and he knows how many children, and they're suffering, suffering how many children were sacrificed to the sun god Baal. That's, that's, the, that's the creepy, horrible part of those pagan, demonic holidays. And it's time for us to understand it. Oh, it's such an ugly truth. It is ugly truth. That's why we don't keep Christmas. Because first of all, Christ was not born on that day. And second of all, because it's a Roman pagan pagan celebration. But that paganism goes to the gruesome, horrible details of sacrificing helpless children to the sun god Baal. That's why it is so horrible. That's why, because if you keep such a such a holiday, brethren, what does that do to your spiritual state? It just brings you demons, invites demons in your lives. It just brings you curses upon yourselves. We need to understand that fully. It's not like, oh, we don't keep Christmas because we are so different from the world. And by the way, Christ was not born on that day. Yes, it's true. We don't keep Christmas for that reason. But there is additional reason to all of that. You know, it's celebration of the sun god. All of this nominal Christianity is nothing else but service, cult to sun. We have to, we have to get rid of that. We have to root out sun cult out of our lives. It's not. It's easier said than done. Because you wouldn't believe how many, how many customs in the world or our national customs are just related to superstition, belief in, 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 in immortal souls, uh, uh, honor to the sun god. We have to get it finally. It's disgusting, bloody and abominable celebration. Yeah, humans have forgotten about it. They say, oh, but we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Oh, really? Yeah, sure. But we Christians know it's a bloody custom continuation, like we're continuation of the you know old worldwide church of God, we're a continuation of the positive positive traditions. It's a continue Christmas and others is continuation of the negative, horrible, bloody, uh, abominable customs of sacrificing children to the sun god. Oh, Sasha, this is so horrible. Yes, it is horrible. That's another reason why we don't keep those things. That's another reason why we should beware of those things. That's another reason why next Sabbath we are fasting, brethren, to ask God of Israel to protect us from all those curses and demons that in a few days will be in your nations and in a few weeks, two weeks, will be in this nation and many other nations in the East that keep Christmas on different date. And so much superstition is, is, is involved in that Christmas when you read about the, all those customs and stuff that you, you have enough information in English about it. We have got we have found recently some good information in Serbian. There was an ethnologist who has reconstructed the old Serbian native religion, which is horrendous. It's all dedicated to the sun god. Every native religion of, every, of of any nation, brethren, black, white, yellow, is dedicated, you have noticed it, I guess, to the sun god. Christmas not being an exception. 
That's why we don't keep Christmas, you know. But I don't want us to be a, a people known for not keeping Christmas, for keeping the, only the Sabbath and holidays and stuff. I want us to be people who are educated. These things we're going through, these Sabbaths, are doctrinal, doctrinal uh, uh, teachings of the Bible. And I want us to understand it because we're going to be teachers in the world tomorrow. How are we going to teach others to be converted? And how are we going to tell them Jesus Christ says be converted if we don't know what conversion really means? So the religious leaders of this world have not fully understood anything that is related to Christ. They have instead attached a meaning to the word, word conversion, far diluted from the pure truth of the Bible when it comes to conversion. You know, the, the word conversion is far diluted in their, in, their, in their sense, in their minds. Because commonly the term is used to mean that simple change one makes when he embraces a new faith, a new denomination. So he, he is no longer a Christian, now he is Jewish. Oh, he is, he is converted to Judaism. Oh, he is converted to Christianity. Oh, he is converted to Islam. So, you know, one who changes his beliefs or one uh, is, as it were, for say from Judaism to Christianity or, we, or, or of whatever denomination, it said uh, that that person is a convert. That's that's the name for the for the, that person. That has nothing to do with true spiritual Bible conversion, and it's not the true substance and meaning of conversion as explained in God's holy word. To the contrary, Christ's statements that we just read in Matthew 18 says that unless unless they were converted, they would not enter the kingdom of God. That statement, brethren, was not given to the world, was not given to I don't know whom else. It was given to the people. Christ said it to the people who are already labeled by the Bible as disciples. So he said that to his disciples. Certainly such ones would already be professing a belief in Jesus and hence be already converted, under quotation mark, in the sense most often meant by this world. Now further, Christ also told the Apostle Peter in, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verse 32, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. <laughs> when you are converted, he said, he says to one of his disciples. So clearly, even the apostles, although in every way expressing their profound belief in Jesus, were not during all Jesus' life, even themselves, yet converted. Isn't that shocking truth to you? Well, fine, it's shocking, but that's what the Bible reveals to us. You see, and so many people believe that if they keep the holiday and the Sabbath, they understand everything. Now, nobody really needs to there to teach them. You know, of course, conversion. Yes, keep the Sabbath and holidays. No, brethren, it's much deeper than that. And I don't want us to be superficial people who just keep Sabbath and Sabbath. I told you million times, and I'm going to repeat it million and million more times. Sabbath is a sign between God's people, sign to God's people who their true God is, and sign to God who his people among the peoples of this world are. It's a sign between us and God, not between us and the world. Yes, Sabbath is part of Christian life. Yes, 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 yes. Million times, yes. It's a special covenant. Yes, separate from the old covenant. We have just got, we have just got the beautiful our booklet on the Sabbath, brethren. It's the best piece of literature I've seen on the Sabbath. It addresses every single uh, uh, objection that the nominal Christians have about the Sabbath. And then it touches upon something else, which will be very relevant to all of you who thought, oh, we are just Gentiles, and what do we have to do with this house of Israel? Well, it touches upon Israelites. It touches upon our identity as well. Because it was a separate covenant between Israel and God, and for Israelites in all generations, as it says in the Bible. And then in our booklet we ask the question, uh, because we address the, uh, the, 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 uh, we address the Anglo-Saxon audience. And then we said, oh, by the way, in all Israelites, they're all bound to keep the Sabbath. By the way, British and America, you who hate the Sabbath so much and say that it's for the Jews and the Jewish and so on, by the way, what is your identity? If the Sabbath covenant is bound for all Israelites in all of their generations, then... British and Americans do realize do realize what kind of what kind of uh, uh, deceived people you all are. Do you realize? 
Yes, the rest of the world is deceived as well. But yes, but I just illustrated to you that the rest of the world also has got Israelitish population here, there, everywhere, in various pockets. And that God might be calling people who really do have, regardless of their origin, that might have some Israelites in their ancestry. That makes perfect sense to me. Because Christ said he has come only for his own. Only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. If he said it in the first century, why would it be different in the 21st century, I wonder? So if he came for all of us, black, white, yellow, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Kenya, Uganda, Serbia, and so on, well then, brethren, he came and opened up minds of the lost Israelites <laughs> to bring them back, bring them back to their God. Because in the kingdom of God, one of our, well, the, or perhaps the main purpose of us being in the kingdom of God will be to establish God's law all over the earth. He tried to do it through the angels. It didn't work. He wanted to do it through Adam and Eve. It didn't work because both angels and the first humans rebelled against him. And well, now he's going to succeed because he's preparing the government. The kingdom of God is at the same time the ruling government of God. He's preparing us to be servants of his. Right now we are ambassadors. You know, every ambassador represents a foreign country. Ambassadors for Jesus Christ, the Savior of all mankind. I think there is a song. Yes, indeed. We're ambassadors of true Jesus Christ who was not born on Christmas and who was not resurrected on Easter and who was not two days or one and a half day in the tomb and then came back to life. We represent the true Jesus Christ of the scriptures. Who is, by the way, the king of Israel and whom his disciples ask, Lord, will you at this time, will you restore the kingdom of Israel? Brethren, why should we be ashamed of any of that? Why should we? We should be happy about our heritage. That's our heritage. That's why we are the hope of Israel. And you may say, well, why wasn't this, why wasn't this, all of this pointed out? But, well, I don't know why. And I don't care why. What I know is that as the hope of Israel, we are going to be pounding this truth, at least that our, our members first should understand it. I want when it prays, you know, when you see Terry Nelson in Africa and then those wonderful videos and, uh, and people just dancing and kind of singing so happily, I'm thinking, yes, I want all of Africa, all of our members in Africa to sing and dance, understanding that Israelites, many Israelites were assimilated in their nations and that they themselves most likely have Israelitish descent. I want them to be, I want them to be glorifying God for their identity. I want those in Asia to feel happy and re relieved. I want them to know that the greatest, one of the greatest, first greatest Israelitish empire was not the British Empire. It was the Parthian Empire right there in Asia. But some of them know it, brethren. Some of them know it because this guy from Afghanistan, our friend from Afghanistan, sent us, sent us the maps with locations mentioned in First Chronicles, which are locations now right there in Pakistan and Afghanistan. So it's not even, you see, it's not even a secret to various other people in those countries. And we, of all people, should be then ignorant and say, oh, no, 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 Pakistan and Afghanistan are Gentile nations. Yes, spiritually, all nations are Gentile. Including all of you who are Israelites, you are Gentile, you are Gentile who are Israelites in always traditionally understood Israelitish countries. You are all in Gentiles before you turn to Israel. So those of you in, in, in Australia who are not baptized yet, and those of you in America who are not baptized yet, even though you're physically speaking of Israelitish descent, you're still spiritually speaking, you're Gentiles. God considers you Gentiles. And those who are baptized in Africa and Asia and so on, well, they're all the Israel. <laughs> they're spirit-led Israel, you see. We are, you see, do you realize, brethren, God is forming out of us the remnant of Israel, true Israel, that keeps his law, statutes, and commandments. And he is returning us to our identity, or returning us to, to himself. 
that's how we're ambassadors of true Jesus Christ. We're ambassadors of the true kingdom of God, kingdom of Israel coming. We're ambassadors because we represent that brilliant truth. And like in John 8, the, the words of Jesus Christ, you shall know the truth, you shall get to know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. How free we are when we know our identity. How free we are when we understand what God had in mind with Israel. But he never, he never changed that plan that he had with Israel, brethren. He just changed the tactic. All right. You want to be pagans? That's what you want, my children? Fine. Let me let me spread you all over the place, sift you into all the nations, and you're going to lose your identity and become pagans. But however, oh, Jesus Christ comes. I've come only for my own. I've only come, I've only been sent to the lost house, lost sheep of the house of Israel. Oh, well, well. So he did not deny and I told you about it. Where did the, the apostles, Jesus Christ's apostles go? Look at the beginning of James' epistle, brethren. There is no way you can get around the truth about Israel. No way. Why should we? It's, it's the, the core Bible doctrine. If you don't understand that one, you will not understand the Bible and Bible prophecies at all. You'll not understand the, the pivotal Old Testament prophecies of Leviticus, Leviticus 26. We should be happy. I want to see our congregation in Africa stomping and, and singing, you know, because they're happy, because they know their identity. And now they're spiritually, of course, returned to the God of Israel because they're keeping the laws and commandments and judgments of Israel. I want them to be happy for that. And they're free from all the superstitions and witchcraft and all the native religion. Oh, don't worry, there are superstitions and witchcraft in a sense in, 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 in the normal Christianity, especially with Catholics and Orthodox. But we are free from that. God has freed us from superstitious fears, from superstitious beliefs, from superstitious practices. But the people around us are not free because you see how diligently they just do all those practices because they think if they don't do, they're not good Christians. They, they, they think they'll be punished by God. I was speaking about my nation, but your nations are not much different. They'll be punished by God. They'll be, you know. So even the apostles during Christ's lifetime were not themselves converted. Just... Then, then just what then is true conversion, brethren? Well, to begin, <laughs> you may say, well, have we begun already? We have, we have begun, but to begin, we need to look no further than the plain and simple meaning of the word conversion itself, as we might use it in any other non-religious context. So to convert something means to change it, and we know it now because we are in the internet age, so we, get, we have to convert this file to the, that file, to this program to that program, this text to that uh, PDF into Word, Word, to PDF and so on. So to convert something means to change it from one purpose or form or use to another one. And this this not hard. It's not hard to understand when you applied that to physical world and context, such as in the case of the conversion of a farm, for example. Well, it has to have to be the file. Could be a farm into a real estate subdivision for homes. The use and purpose of the land has been changed from one thing into something different. Likewise, when one is converted, it goes through conversion. He or she changed from one thing, one type of creature, into another totally different type of person. Or you might just say, put it again in the context of Israelite, might be changed from a Gentile, <laughs> spiritually speaking, to an Israelite. And this conversion, brethren, is not merely a change of profession or faith, although that is included, or of some merely outward form, but it's a total and inward change, you see. That's what conversion means. Now, of course, to change a person means to change his or her mind. And brethren, mind is, that's, sometimes you think, why did God call this crippled person? Why is this person in the wheels? Why, is, well, brethren, why is he called this ugly, perhaps, person? Brethren, because he's not interested in physical. Physical is passing. Physical will pass. God is interested in lasting, everlasting, spiritual. He's interested in mind. And God works with our mind, not so much with our physical body. 
you know, some of us would like to be smarter, some of us would like to be slimmer, some of us would like to be more beautiful or this, that, and the other God doesn't care about it at all. God cares about our mind, brethren. Mind, he works with our mind. So, uh, to change a person means to change he, his or her mind, and that is the way one thinks for a person is his or her mind. In Proverbs 23, 7, it says, As he thinks, as the man thinks, so is he. <laughs> and one's mind is the core of one's personality, character, and thought. To change a person, you do not simply change the hairstyle or wardrobe or the color of the house or whatever. To change person, you change his or her mind. That's why in Romans 12, 2, he tells us about conversion, that we are to become a living sacrifice, pleasing to God. Uh, Romans 12, 2, famous scripture that you can even uh, memorize it. Some of those th things are good to memorize, brethren, because then the word of God is always on your mind. And usually when a problem jumps up before you or it appears in your life or a dilemma or whatever, you usually have the, 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 the answer very quickly when you remember, for example, in Romans 12, 12 through, and to no, do not be conformed to this world, but you be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the key to understanding conversion is to understand that there are two possible types of minds that a person can possess. With God's help, of course. In this case, uh, one of them is with God's help. So it's spiritual mind, and you have a this 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 carnal mind. There is the carnal mind. There is the spiritual mind. And the carnal or fleshly mind uh, is the natural mind that a person has apart from God, and it is influenced by this world and by the ruler of this world, who is Satan, the devil. And it's not the mind of a mere animal but the superior mind of a human and consists of the brain and the spirit in man. Uh, this spirit uh, in man should not be confused with the pagan concept of immortal soul. And also Paul wrote on this carnal mind when he asked, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, What man knows the things of a man except by the spirit of the man which is in him? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. So through that revelation we understand that... Um, humans have got the spirit of man the spirit of man if you realize brethren is not has not been discovered by any science has not been discovered by any religion has not been discovered by anyone nobody on the face of the earth does understand and does know that there is a spirit in man except for converted people of god they understand that that's the spirit in man that gets connected to God's mind, they understand that as the spirit of man, which means makes us humans, makes us above and different from animals. We understand that, brethren, but the world does not. The carnal mind, although it is the mind that occurs naturally and normally within a man, is insufficient for salvation, you see. Now, that's why you have to receive the God's Holy Spirit so that you will be able to serve God in spirit and in truth, if you understand. Because how can you understand, how can you serve God in spirit with capital S if you don't have the spirit? And if you don't have the spirit, the Romans 8 says you're not Christian. If you don't have the same spirit of Christ that Christ has, you have, you, you're not a Christian. And how can you, so how can you please God, even keeping the, all the keeping the Sabbath and holidays, but if you don't have the spirit of God, you don't do it on a spiritual level and with spiritual understanding and with the mind of God in you. Because we have the mind of Christ, it says in Philippians. That was the difference between us and the rest of the world. We have the mind of Christ. How do we have the mind of Christ? Well, because the Spirit, the same Spirit that is in Christ, that rose Christ from the dead, the same Spirit lives now in us. And through that Spirit, God the Father and Jesus Christ live in us. So that's why the carnal mind is insufficient for salvation. And yet... So many people just put off sometimes baptism because they're not perfect enough. You'll never be perfect enough for baptism. Anyone after baptism, you'll never be perfect enough until until the return of Jesus Christ. But I mean, carnal mind itself is insufficient for salvation. I've been trying to uh, explain that to the uh, now Serbian Serbian uh, believers uh, who are basically now most most of them, as far as 
as, as remained faithful are not baptized. So carnal mind, our natural mind with which we were born is insufficient for salvation. And Paul goes on to explain in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, he explains in part why. Because he says the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can we know them because they are spiritually discerned. You see, it's that spirit in men that gets connected with the Holy Spirit at baptism that God grants as a gift. He sends it from heaven straight into a person's mind, and then these two spirits get together, and then the Spirit of God starts to uh, gradually change and dominate in one's life and change one's, one's life. And that's why that's what it means to grow in grace and knowledge. So one reason why the carnal mind is not sufficient is that it cannot discern spiritual things, and indeed such spiritual things seem to the carnal mind like foolishness. Oh, you know how people think that what we what we don't eat that must be very foolish, what we keep the Sabbath that must be also foolish, because they cannot spiritually discern it. We who spiritually discern it, going back to the Sabbath, that's again, I'm very excited about Sabbath book, the brethren, the Sabbath book that we have produced is superb, of superb, all of our literature is of superb quality. We're trying to respond to all the spiritual needs that people bring up. They bring up a question, they bring up a topic and stuff, and we realize, oh, wait a second, this is relevant. This is relevant, this is important to some people today. Let's, let's, then, let's then respond to that, and we just come up with a succinct, nice articles and booklets that we use the latest one was about the pets the the, the the wonderful how the way we treat animals how that's reflection of god's care and love for us and for our needs and it's beautiful we are the only church of god that has produced that kind of literature well brethren that will be a wonderful witness to many owners of pets Many owners of dogs and cats and other animals will be that will be a wonderful witness to them that what they're doing and the way how they treat animals is really a reflection of God's character. They probably never thought about that. But here we are to testify that to them. And who knows? Who knows how many and we're the only church of God as far as I know that they have done it. They has done it. As far as the booklet is concerned, the booklet of the Sabbath is, is wonderful. No, I'm not saying that there are no other good booklets on the Sabbath. Don't, don't get me wrong. No, I'm not saying that. In fact, there is a good quality literature produced by various churches of God indeed. But the, the one that we produced is so, so down to earth. It's so simple. It's so wonderful. It addresses all the concerns and all the comments and all the objections. And then, brilliantly, it touches upon our identity <laughs> it just all of a sudden you know we keep the sabbath well look it's a eternal covenant with all israelites and of course you say we're not oh are you sure are you sure that you're not israelites and after all even if you're not if you turn to keep the sabbath then you're keeping the covenant uh, sign the mark the covenant that god established with israel so you automatically become Israelite, spirit-led, what I call spirit-led Israelite. So one way or the other, just like to this pagan world, all the, all the ways lead to Rome. There is a saying that, at least in Serbian, in our spiritual life, all the, uh, you see, <laughs> all the ways lead to Jerusalem, brethren. Because it was God of Israel who sent the Holy Spirit to the 120 people gathered in Jerusalem on the first Pentecost in the New Testament. All of that we keep, you see. <coughs> That's why we're a continuation of the original church. We keep practice what the original church did, but, brethren, do we have the same understanding of the important topics that the original church had? I'm not sure that we could boast that we had it, but now, as time goes on, you see, we're just going through all of those, all those topics, and we are indeed filling the gaps. We are being educated because Church of God is not a spiritual, it's not a social club that we come. Oh, wonderful! We just see each other every Sabbath. Yes, that's part of our spiritual life, but the integral part has to become our education. We cannot live in ignorance. And to shame of many churches of God, you see people, secular people in Afghanistan and Pakistan, or people who, even secular, but even those who might be religious, they do understand 
that parts of the house of Israel was exiled to those countries. They do understand about the Pashtuns of Afghanistan. They do understand something that we have not understood for decades or that we ignored for decades. We ignored Josephus for decades. And it's time now we are successor to Herbert Armstrong who said that we that he discovered only the trunk of the tree. We we appreciate that. His book to the, the United States and Britain in Prophecy was the most requested of all the books and books he has written. So he 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 struck the foundation. He got the trunk of the tree. Good. We are now going to get into the branches and leaves of the tree, and we are now going to complete the picture, which is tremendously exciting, brethren. Tremendously exciting. And then when you start delving into that picture, you just realize, you just realize how the simple plan of salvation for all humankind is even deeper. And it, that, that the house of Israel to this day is an integral part of that, brethren. Somehow we have lost it in our, in our minds, in our understanding. Oh yes, many people were excited to find out there were Israelites and uh, many people in the West were just excited. Uh, many later became not excited because the uh, the apostasy ensured in the old worldwide church of god many just gave up on that truth some label the truth racist and all of that but brethren the excitement should be there now that not only that truth that the trunk of the tree is true but the rest of the tree if you wish is just as equally as exciting as 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 as, as the trunk is and when you connect all the dots and you realize, you may wonder why did I want why did I want us to be as we had to organize ourselves, we had to kind of give ourselves name. Why did I choose name the hope of Israel, brethren? Because that's the essence of the Bible. The hope of the eternal life, the hope of resurrection, the hope of, 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 of life, eternal conquering the last enemy death. The hope of Israel, that's the essence of the Bible. And then, of course, very ingeniously, when we were at the point to be registered in the first first time in, in, in a small African nation, somebody that somebody Terry Nelson just added Worldwide Church of God, and that was a smart move because recently I, I hear it's from uh, from Ghana. Somebody received our Sabbath booklets, our the booklet that I've been praising to you here because I think it's a marvelous piece of literature not because we have composed it but because because of the way how it is composed somebody from Ghana said oh here is Herbert Armstrong be referenced here oh he said now I know that you are the true church of God oh indeed just like the Malavian government when recognizing us Registering us said, you are the true Christians. Brethren, isn't that something? Doesn't that testify something to, we're the true Christians with the name, the hope of Israel, Worldwide Church of God. You know, you know how much significance is in the name. Just in the name itself. Just in the name that I feel so proud of because my library, my little library here, that I just, which I were, which was established, that I established with a purpose to defend our faith and defend our identity. The first I called the library, the Hope of Israel. I got it from Jeremiah 17. Oh, Mikve Israel, translated in our languages, Oh, Hope of Israel. And then when we came to the point that we have to, well, what shall we do now? We have to reorganize. We have to separate from some bad people. What shall we do? I thought, well, indeed, the hope of Israel. Isn't it the end time? Isn't it the time for the whole world to be hit with the knowledge about the hope of Israel? Yes, indeed, brethren. And our Sabbath booklet just, you know, unexpectedly <laughs> testifies about the sign which God established with Israel for all generations, a sign between him and his people. And the Apostle Paul, now getting back to the conversion topic, in another place in Romans chapter 8, 
proclaims the need to convert the carnal mind to the spiritual mind in even stronger terms. Look at Romans 8, verse 8, uh, verse 6, verse 6, 7, and 8. Romans 8, 6. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Yes, to be spiritually minded better is to get to know your identity as well and then have peace. No, I'm not a stranger to this covenant with Israel. No, I'm part of it. I am part of the story from the start to the end. Because, Paul continues, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Now you see why carnal mind is insufficient for salvation. So then those who are in the flesh, in other words, those who have a carnal mind, cannot please God. And this then is the reason Christ said, if we are not converted, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. Brethren, you will say, oh, this is so simple. Yes, of course it's simple. But I'm asking you, have you ever understood it this way? It's time for us to become educated, spirit-led Israel. Because we're to be kings and priests, and priests used to be the most literate, the most educated class of the people in the Old Testament. And we're going to be kings and priests in the kingdom to come, in the kingdom of Israel. So what kind of educated people of understanding should we be so that we can spread that education and spread the same understanding to the in the world tomorrow that will be under the government of God? So therefore, because carnal mind cannot please God, cannot serve God, cannot understand anything spiritual, it's therefore cut off from God because to be carnally minded is death, says verse 8, verse 6 in Romans 8. But you see, the spiritual mind, or on the other hand, is different from the carnal mind. It has an additional component, which is the Holy Spirit of God. And indeed, this is why Apostle Paul says next in verse 9, of Romans 8, verse 9, because the Apostle Paul says, but you are not in the flesh. In other words, you do not have a mere carnal mind, but in the spirit, in other words, you have spiritual mind. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. As simple as that, verse 9. Yes, to have a spiritual mind and to be converted, to even be a Christian in God's eyes, brethren, you must have a spiritual mind. And that only comes from having God's Spirit dwelling within you, as you can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, sorry, chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. You just only have, you know, if the Spirit of God, the same God of Israel dwells in you, you have this spiritual mind, which then you have a precondition for salvation, otherwise you don't. In Acts 2, 38, the famous first God-inspired sermon of the Apostle Peter, we are told how we may receive the converting Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit that converts us. Well, upon repentance, we can be baptized, and after the laying on hand, on of, of hands, which follows baptism, baptism into the water is by when you are immersed, you're baptized, and then comes the, uh, the act of laying on of hands to ask God in clean, now spiritual vessel to send his spirit from heaven to join with your spirit in man that is in you. So, after baptism, we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit that gives us a spiritual mind and converts us to creatures God can use. Therefore, to become converted, we must repent and be baptized. There is no other way. But even here, some People have misunderstood, it seems, because they link that once a person has received God's Spirit, conversion is total and complete, and that the person cannot or will not sin at all, ever. Brethren, that is not the case. That's stupid. That's why we have the Passover services, and I do have a draft of the Passover booklet. I know that the Passover is coming up as the first next and in that booklet i have a little book small book uh, on the subject in serbian already and i'm going to follow up now with english you'll have hopefully i hope very soon before the passover you'll have the booklet on the passover that explains to you all the uh, symbolism of the passover which 
I think most of you do understand, but also that to explain to you even the washing of feet, it's not just a, 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 a simple and by the way, by the way ordinance. And with Passover, why do we what do we do at the Passover? We renew our commitment, we renew our covenant with God that we entered into at baptism. In other words, we be coming after the baptism, after the Passover service, we're as clean from all the sins as we were once we were immersed into our water at our baptism, into the water at, at baptism. You see. So if, if Christians never sin after baptism, then there is no need for the Passover service. And then the the words of uh, John, the Apostle John, in his first, first epistle, is John one eight, I think which says, whoever says that he has no sin is a liar and the truth is not in him. We always have constantly to fight our sinful, sinful, horrible human nature in us, brethren. The greatest enemy of our salvation is our human nature. That's another topic. So there are three big monsters we have to fight. The greatest monster is our human nature. Second monster is the world around us, which is ruled by the third monster, Satan the devil. But that's why we need the Holy Spirit, because we cannot prevail against those forces with our carnal minds, you see. So, spiritually, Paul talks about the growth process in many places, including Romans 7. So, conversion is a process... And it's likened in the Bible to the process of baby's gestation and birth. In both cases, the newly conceived person, and we're spiritually conceived by the Spirit of God, so newly conceived person, be it physical child or spiritual child of God, must grow and develop over time before birth, before being, in our case, born again at Christ's return. So spiritually, Paul talks about this growth in many places, including Romans 7, which I always recommend to baptism candidates to read because if you read all Romans 7 and see you can see how Paul describes the struggle he had to endure while the still remaining carnal component of his nature struggled against the Spirit of God and dwelling within him and in the case of a physical child in time that child will be born as a separate person able to live on its own likewise a spiritual convert must change and grow until the resurrection when he or she will be literally born again, as Jesus says to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 3 through 6, he explains to Nicodemus that one has to be born of the Spirit. This time one is born of the Spirit and will enter then, born, being born of the Spirit, not of the flesh, will then enter the a kingdom, kingdom of God, God's kingdom, God's family as a spirit being. So God's family is going to be expanded drastically at Christ's return. And I hope that you cherish that vision, brethren, because without vision, people perish. And I hope that all of this knowledge that you're receiving for free, that you're cherishing it because, brethren, my people are perishing for the lack of knowledge, says Prophet Hosea. And it would be a shame that now, in these end times, when the knowledge is increasing all the time, according to Daniel's prophecy, that we be, of all the people, ignorant about such a, a, a crucial, such a critical, such a substantial knowledge as is the house of Israel. And the role the house of Israel plays in the plan that God has for salvation of all humankind. So at the time of our resurrection, the conversion from physical to spiritual will be complete and our carnal fleshly mortality will be displaced and it will be swallowed up by life, as, God, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.4, that death will be swallowed up by life and we will be quite literally a new creature. So truly, to see the kingdom of God, brethren, we must be indeed, as Christ said, converted in mind and eventually in body as well. Now, the process of conversion is so important, so uh, it might be helpful perhaps if you will mark in your Bible some of these verses, key verses, uh, or some of them of key verses are right here. 
I've got them about one, two, four, six. Matthew 18, 3. We must be converted or we will not enter God's kingdom. Luke chapter 22, verse 32. Conversion is not merely belief, because even Peter, though he believed, was told he had yet to be converted. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Conversion involves a change in our mind. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 through 14. The carnal mind does not understand the spiritual things. Only the spiritual mind does. Romans 8, verse 5 through 9. The carnal mind is not sufficient for salvation and the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. The indwelling of God's Holy Spirit is the source of the spiritual mind. And finally, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. The Spirit of God is given to those who repent and are properly, in a Bible fashion, baptized. Biblically fashion, baptized. So, in conclusion, brethren, unless you are converted, proclaim Jesus, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. But with proper baptism and the consequent receipt of God's Holy Spirit, we can become a new creature, as we are described in 2 Corinthians 5.17. We can become new creature, indeed converted, with the hope of eternal glory.